because one of the things I've talked about in these podcasts is how much of our ourselves do we project into history when we're talking about it and how much can we have abstract and that that kind of thing so I, I wondered because you do a lot more than I do in more of a varied areas of history how do you feel that your own perspective kind of impacts on how you talk about history Jason when I was 21 I think I knew everything and uh, there was nothing I didn't know about history. And now the older I get, the more I think, yeah, my goodness me, it's still so contingent on who we are and what's going on in our life. Because suddenly I read every history book and it's and all I read is Donald Trump, Boris Johnson, climate breakdown. I, I'm just reading about, you know, contemporary issues. Even I'm reading about the Medici or I'm reading about um, ch you know, Chinese history recently. I, I just keep feeling, oh, yeah, that's exactly like the, you know, Jeff Bezos at the moment, you know, and all, all the, you know, the privatization of the, our, our space endeavors and things like that. So I think it's, I'm hopeless. I'm the worst. I think I'm always putting myself and my, 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 my world into the past whenever I read it. So, um, and I think that's, it's changed. Um, I had a, did a really interesting pod the other day with a, a woman who was writing about the, the working working motherhood you know this extraordinary transformation history from sort of when women who work and then they're sort of and in in, in, then they were sort of in the domestic sphere and then they go out to work and you know, how and when that all occurs and she was saying that her experience of living through lockdown and try, trying to be a working mother and homeschooling and things has, has, has changed even though she was absolutely she studied this for years wrote a prize-winning book she said it's transformed her opinion on on the on writing the history so I think I think our we are so in, we are really important in the way that we think about the past, I think, surely. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd agree entirely. I think the now reflects how we interpret the past in, almost entirely. It's very difficult to put yourself in the position of somebody and, and remove knowledge from your own brain about the world or the, the, the greater. Now, I was looking at the Mapa Mundi um, uh, the other day and thinking, what an incredible artifact that is. And yeah, it was a, it was a tourist attraction apart from anything, you know, you, you've, you've gone all the way to Hereford Cathedral, what else can you pay a, a penny to go and see? And the Mapa Mundi is the summary of the, of the world with Jerusalem at the middle and heaven at the top. And, and, and it, it's almost a mind map. And I'm not sure that anybody really thought it was actually geographical as much as a sort of a reflection of how the world was seen at the time by many people in the West. And I wonder when we look at Magna Carta, for example, and the, 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 the things that run up to that, and we, we reflect on it, and it's, it's all been, it's all, I think it's only four clauses of it that are actually relevant anymore. A lot of it was about fishing, um, which is fascinating when I read it. It's obsessed with fishing. Yeah, fish traps and, and religious things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But um, it's so hard to put ourselves in the minds of the people that were there fighting for what they saw not really because it wasn't ordinary people's rights was it it was more about the barons can't be abused uh, and had their own armies than ordinary people there was no consideration really for ordinary quotes people but um how do you when you're presenting when you're putting together your ideas for history how, how do you how, how do you start uh, with them and how do you reflect on it because do you write scripts or do you extemporize and, and as you're presenting, explore the well, idea? Well, so much, Jason, that's interesting in there. But I think one, uh, just on your the first point about the Map Monday and all that sort of stuff, I think, um, isn't it interesting also how this year, suddenly with the pandemic, Black Lives Matter, um, awareness of violence towards women that we've all had here in the UK recently, and and just, just on those three, and, and maybe around big you know big government versus little government oh maybe big government's back because it's kind of useful when there's a giant pandemic on you know it's, uh, and and also sorry i keep thinking of the list but also the re-emergence of like great power rivalry between china and the u.s between arguably china russia and the u.s suddenly those things that we i, I wouldn't have been sensitive to if i'd written it when i was writing a book about the battle of quebec 10 years ago suddenly I'm like, should I have talked about slavery more in this book? Like, it's kind of weird. Or should I, should I have been, should I have talked about these, just your choice of adjectives, the kind of, and, and it's, it's so true. And when I go back and read history books written in the Edwardian period, you know, that they were, they were like condemnatory of Henry the second, of Henry the first for like 
wearing stupid clothes and being a bit effeminate and possibly having sex with men. You know, like that was like absolutely That's- devastating. Whereas we tend to probably go, wow, that their treatment of women was, was truly remarkable in this period or their kind of uh, like their their use just their embrace of violence like they're just mm. violence the kind of practical everyday tool of government that's something edwardians maybe were a bit more chilled about so i think it's 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 so interesting um in terms of how i i'm working at the moment well you know like you I've, i'm kind of really embracing and really really enjoying this new world in which we're living around sort of digital content so now I, my, most of my work is online and it's either sort of podcast or tv shows but so I, I i i don't write scripts like i used to because i think writing scripts in the old days um there were a lot of gatekeepers certainly when i worked at the bbc and there'd be levels of command they don't want to see a script because they want to make sure you weren't going to embarrass them or the bbc or you know and sometimes that was absolutely right they they would they had a very high standard of factual accuracy at the bbc which was very which is great and remains particularly in this fake news environment that we're in now i think really important but a lot of it was also just around everyone wanted to chip in with ideas and i think i think you've moved into movie making and i'm sure you're you're very much cutting a different path but you know traditionally within movies there were the, the, these you know hugely bureaucratic processes scripts went in one end and came out the other about something completely different virtually um and i so, so i'm moving away from scripts now and trying to keep it a lot fresher and i know from your your online work that i've watched it's you know you're you're a big believer in freshness yes. um, and, and i think because because why not you know like i think we've it, 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 we, I love now just going out and I was out kayaking the other day out here off my house we went out to Hurst Castle which has seen Henry VIII's castles where it's sadly undermined by time and tide and it's collapsing into the solar and it was just like right no script it was the day after the collapse happened let's get out there um, it was we, we you know it was you, you've got your bullet points the things you want to cover mm-hmm. you, you know in that way I'd be really interested actually how you work because you come from a gaming world where you have to storyboard it but but you know I had my bullet points and then I and then and then I thought the audience want to hear freshness you know it's like mm-hmm. as long as you're delivering that content and you've always got what we call in the industry voiceover for your listeners that's that's when you're watching pictures and, and it's the presenter's voice just kind of mysteriously appears ra- rather than a piece to camera where you can see them talking. The voiceover is the bit that you, uh, the bit where they, they add their voice to pictures later. And you can put a lot of the heavy content in there if you want. Well, then, uh, don't worry, in 1542, uh, this happened. So if you don't remember everything you want to say on location, that's fine. Because I believe the bit that are interesting on location and stuff I see you do is, you know, my sword arm is just absolutely exhausted. It just shows, you know, this is my horse is behaving this certain way. And so I was out there talking about the the, the solar the tides. Oh, you know, here I am, my kayak. That's the stuff you can't replicate. And it's also the stuff it's hard to script because you want to talk about the tides. Well, if you go out the wrong time of day, the tide is going from left to right, not right to left. So I, I was in meetings when I was a kid, broadcaster at the BBC, and they were like, you know, make sure you mention here about the big crowds of people that go to this shrine every week. And you're like, well, hang on, we're not going to be there at a weekend. There's going to be no people. It's just don't, don't like leave it up to us. Leave it up to your field agents to work that out on the day. You know, and there were these the people in the office didn't want to give too much power to people going out. But now I'm completely on the other side. I'm much more swashbuckling, I believe, in getting out there, finding out what the story is, having your facts, having your bullet points, like you know, in your in your ammo case, but 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 using them as and when the situation and, and let the pictures and the the action kind of tell the story and carry the narrative. I, I, I'd agree with you entirely. I think authenticity of voice and your immediate response. You go somewhere and you might have read about it, but when you go there and experience it, it might bring out a whole different area of thought for you. I mean, there's a, there's a story I tell in one of the things about um, jousting, closing my visor, and then a fly flying into my helmet yeah. and buzzing around. And for me, when it was happening, it was a bit distracting. And then afterwards, I thought, that must have happened in history, but nobody would ever yeah. write about it. It's a very personal experience. <laughs> And um, it's funny, um, but also distracting. And you potentially could be lethal, that kind of small moment. Um, but it, it, it's the sort of thing, it's one of the reasons why I love the horses and I like actually trying things out is personal experience is quite rare. I mean, I, I love my book history and I love the, the whole academic side of it and the studying old documents and things, but they are one perspective on history and often written from a clever perspective or with a view to 
the legacy you're going to leave behind when you write the book, as opposed to complaining about yeah, the quality of the copper that's just been sent to you because it's rubbish and some of those early Mesopotamian tablets are ordinary lives. And it's something I'm fascinated by. King, kings and emperors are all wonderful, but what, what are ordinary people's lives like? And how did they brush their teeth? How did they make fire? What did they do to get up in the morning like we all do? You know, how did people wash? Because hot water is a, is a rare and expensive thing. So you've got to be washing in cold water a lot of the time. It's not very nice, to be honest. Jason, every time I have it, this is what it is to be a weird historian. Listen, uh, like well, history, certainly history, history fans, like you know, like I am. But um, anyone listening to this, this is what it is. Like every time I'm in a hot shower, I think this is a bloody miracle. I'm in a house. I'm not even on the ground floor, and there's a system that pumps hot water onto me and changes my day every time I have a shower. Like it, it's like essential to well-being, and it's like that is a that is a that's historically speaking, that's a kind of miracle. You know, only the only the kings and emperors would have had that. You know, f- a thousand years ago, um, it is a, it is a, it's a marvel, isn't it? But I think, Jason, you're you know you're in a very you're in a wonderful position because you're answerable to no one. You've you've built this empire by yourself. You don't have to worry about anyone. There are, there are no gatekeepers. There's no one who you're trying to impress. And I think you can. What's what's great about you go? This is what I'm interested in. I suspect other people can be interested in it too. And and it is the. It's the it's the bits of it's the it's the exp- I mean the fly and the, the visor is great fun, and, and and you know people are always really rude about TV history and and nowadays we'd call it I don't know on online video history, but I and because one of the things you have to do as everyone who's watched TV shows know is you as a presenter you've got to go and like you know try and row the Viking ship or you've got to ride the try and shovel coal into the firebox of a nineteenth century train, but I can honestly say I can honestly say. I feel it's been a great privilege for me to do those things. And it has made me, if and when I ever did want to return to try and being a proper historian, it, is, it will have made me a much, much better historian. Because it is, you, you, there are certain things that only become very clear and they become instantly clear. Instantly, yes. like standing on the deck of a ship and getting seasick. Like, oh, I'm now seasick and everything has changed. Like, I just want to, or, or actually something I experienced the other day, I had my first kind of adult chronic pain thing you know I had a condition a little thing thank goodness got fixed but for a couple of weeks I was in pain constantly and I thought this is the shittest if I'm allowed to say that on this podcast Mm -hmm. this is the worst experience of my life and if someone walked up to me and offered me two million pounds if I could have this pain for another year or 10 years I would immediately say no like it would be a no-brainer and you know as you know so well so many people in the past decision makers uh, people who who changed the course of history, they would have been living with chronic pain or or with bereavement, like savage bereavement issues, kids dying, plague, who knows? And and I and that's something that I just don't see in books. I just don't mm. see that. Well, well, you know, yeah, everyone's like, well, it's fascinating. Why did mm, that's, why did he why did that king decide to do that? Uh, it's, it makes no sense. Perhaps it was because of this. It's like no, 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 no. What what if it wasn't because of that? What if he was like James II, not fighting? not putting up much of a fight against William III when he landed in 1688. What if it's because James II had these chronic nosebleeds, the weather was terrible, it felt kind of apocalyptic, and he just completely, as we all do every day, he just lost his morale. And he'd, and there's no deep statute law or texts or or kind of 8th, 17th century philosophy that explains it. It's just he had an absolute shocker and collapsed, as, as, as you and I know. Well, you probably haven't, but I certainly have. No. And, and I, think, I think that stuff is so... I mean, I learned so much uh, sailing this Viking boat out of... You, I mean, I, I'm sure you've done it, but if you haven't, it's what should No, I haven't, about? yeah. No, it's something I really want to do, right, yeah. Because it's right in your ballpark. Yeah. Ross Kilda, and we left Ross Kilda, and we sailed north, and we were going up Jutland, and we were eating the stuff, and we were sailing the ship, and and then we and then the weather like and also the weather for you he he said look we haven't got google maps or anything we haven't gotten that charts but you know where sweden is it's there you know where Denmark because look at the clouds you just you just know you look at them the clouds are completely different over land even though you can't see the land he goes the baltic is a very good place to learn how to sail and it's kind of safe and then we ran in up the beach we had a problem with something holding our t- our rudder to the side of the ship you need a you need a turns out you need a a, a sapling 
silver mm-hmm. birch tree and you stick it through and then you use the roots to gra- like tie the roots around <laughs> the steering oar and then the tree then you you bring it through a hole in the hull and that lashes it to the hull basically and you, then you have a steering oar and we went into a, a supermarket car park we walked to the beach went and chopped a tree down. We chopped with those, you know, in the supermarkets, you always got those little, they always yes. plant those to try and make the community yeah. happy. Yeah. And we asked permission. And then we chopped the trees down and we just carried it off with us. And you just thought, my God, they can, they, every single thing on this boat, everything that you can, as long as you've got some iron ingots, like some, and you, again, you know better than I do, but you, you need a bit of iron around. So you can take mm-hmm. that as ballast. But as long as you've got that, wherever you stop, you can make fire, you can do blacksmithing and you can basically make that boat again if you've got what you've got the techniques you you know there's not you can go oh well you know we have to replace 10 12 40 planks that's how you can do that and being out with them and experiencing that was i feel uh, you know knowledge that you could not gain from a book yeah it's the it's the the knowledge i mean i think one of the things that we often forget is the the incredible adaptability of the of the of the human mind to solve problems if you really have to you know, you're there, you're stuck, you've got a plank that's gone on your boat. Okay, we'll fix it, lads. You know, you have no alternative. You can't phone anybody and ask for rescue. Then nobody's going to come. There's no admin either. I often feel like the world is controlled by bits of paper that allow us to travel from X place to Y place, and we've got to get permission for this, and this is the way it's done. But back in those days, it was, we have a boat, we have a bunch of brawny lads, and we have weapons, because that's an important part of it. Who's going to stop us? Only somebody who has more brawny lads and weapons because we're going over there to explore. And this sort of nature of exploring is that they might have to fight. And because death was ever present, you know, death, you know, child mortality was awful and you would be killing animals to eat them. Um, even if you didn't enjoy it, you would be doing that. So, so the idea of, of death and life was, was very different than it is now. I mean, we go into, and I'm guilty of this as well, but you know, death for modern people is, for most people in the West anyway, is, is very removed, mostly, not all, all the time, but is, is largely quite removed from us. Whereas earlier periods, medieval period in particular, it was very immediate and very apparent. And, and as you say, I mean, let's say Henry VIII had that separating wound for, for decades that stank. Um, and, you know, he's a powerful king, an export star, so by the standards of the time, tall, very handsome, incredibly wealthy, decided to be in charge of his own church, so he'd even got that on his side. And there was nothing he could do about the pain and the stench of his leg. And he would have been completely aware of it hurting and distracting him at every moment, even in the most intimate moments of his life, he's going to be in pain. And you know, I, I, I lived with for two weeks, live with tooth pain and quite frankly it was extraordinarily debilitating yeah. uh, and I, it was a like, great i can finally and it was such a relief psychologically as well as physically to get rid of it but imagine being that all-powerful king who can't get rid of that pain at all medical you know and you can even see the cutout in the royal armor is on his armor there's a piece missing in one of his greaves which is where they suppose that the 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 separating wound was but you know imagine that just as a psychological impact on you let alone the stench that would have been coming from that kind of wound uh yeah amazing it wasn't worse to be honest Uh, well agree i I completely agree with that and i'm very struck as well by your comment the thing i struggle with with history about death and and our relationship to it you know i've been very very privileged in my life and i've been absolutely incredibly lucky that the only people i know who have died i'm 42 years old the only people i know who've died have been really old you know intimate to me the close close family and and it's been a great loss but but you know i'm i'm very very lucky um and i know that's perhaps unusual even today but 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 it's not it's not it would have been unheard of in 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 the 15th century uh, and i don't know whether sometimes they're you read about these lives now of course you're reading about the kind of exceptional lives because maybe they're that's the ones you're that's why you're reading them but they just lived with a certain velocity a certain energy that you makes you think maybe they weren't worried about their pension you know maybe you know we're all we we like go oh it's worth putting five years in at this company because you might get you know but but maybe they go well i don't know if i'm be alive in five years time so maybe Mm. there was a a kind of energy to their and a pace to their life that we think we live fast paced today but i mean 
you know these these some of these characters that you read about were getting in scrapes and and i mean i just did a podcast on cellini the renaissance artist i mean he's lived more harder than any rock star today any <laughs> soldier any you know uh, it's it, it, there must have been a sense that you know this could all end tomorrow frankly i've buried my siblings i've buried my kids i've buried my friends it, it was there it was there a kind of a uh, 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 just a uh, who can, let's live for the day kind of spirit yeah. among so many of the people that you study, particularly in, in your field. I think very likely, actually. I think the the idea that disease, death, you know, violent death often was was around the corner. And you know, let's face it: if you don't have a you know, police are a fairly recent invention. I mean, you, you know, you, you had somebody murdered. You, there's a hue and cry, and there's all these sort of. But if you can get away, the, the communication is only as fast as a fast horse. And if somebody is baddie on a fast horse, they're ahead anyway. And you, can you ever find them? But but I, I agree. I think there's a certain fatalistic approach to it, which is, you know, I'm just going to go off and have adventures because, you, you know, I'm, I might. And I wonder whether that's a Viking thing, whether in fact it's not about rape and pillage and thievery. It's just about, come on, lads, let's go and do something interesting with our lives. And uh Let's sail in that direction and see what adventures we can have. And sometimes those adventures turn violent and pillage and, and, and all sorts of bad things. But sometimes they discovered whole continents. Yeah, I think that's I was reading about Polynesians the other day. That, so, you know, as well as the Vikings, I think the most remarkable maritime culture in our history and the Polynesians. It, there was a sense that they weren't chased out of their homelands or, or by, by like a lack of material resources or you know by lack of you know there was an idea that the vikings there was sort of there was a bit of a population explosion maybe not enough arable land and that there were those kind of reasons but this reading about the Polynesian, it just did seem to be particularly young men but young people going no let's 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 live a life less ordinary let's try and make a name for ourselves and go beyond the go beyond the horizon and i can't kind of think that's right and i was reading about 18th we again we're in 18th century which is you know we think about press gangs and the navy was so hard and it was rum sodomy and the lash and and actually there was enormous amounts of volunteering for the navy in mm. the, in the 18th century and i think lots of people like a young captain cook like, well james cook who then became captain cook he would he had a life on the colliers of eastern england going from newcastle london and he, he chose to join the Navy. He volunteered. He thought it'd be, and I think it was the path of a life of adventure and potentially financial gain as well. But, but it, it, it life as it, we, I mean, life on a, tied to a small holding in, in early modern or medieval England would have been pretty grim and never traveling 30 miles from where you were born. I mean, like, I think swapping that for adventure and, you know, potential, well, great risk, I think would have made sense. Yeah. And, and also, you know, the, the power of actually being fed as well, because, you know, in, in our immediate society, you know, we can always go down to, we can't always, but, you know, at the moment we can go down to the supermarket and get food at the drop of a hat. And many people don't have any food in their dwelling. They know they're going to go somewhere for the next meal. Whereas back then you had to grow your food or buy it from the local area or, and it might not be available. You might be hungry. And I think, it's easy to underestimate the value of you'll be fed uh, three square meals a day in the army. Yes, you'll be treated you'll be you'll be treated in a rough way, but you'll you actually have adventures and you'll be fed. And that's incredibly compelling to most young men. Young women obviously weren't invited, but but for the young men being told, yeah, your alternative is to do what your dad has done, which is follow this plough backwards and forwards and the asses of these oxen backwards and forwards, or risk everything your life included but who cares because you're young and nobody thinks they're going to die um and you can have adventures in far off lands and possibly earn riches and meet strange people i mean if you think about it from that perspective i'm surprised they even needed press gangs i'm surprised they did they, they actually ever needed to force people into the boats you know um it's fascinating fascinating period and then Never leaving the ship, unfortunately, for quite a long time. That doesn't sound so good either. <laughs> what happened to the adventures? That will come in a few years. Really? Yes. <laughs> I, I can't. I, yeah, it's very straight. I mean, the the idea of um, Napoleonic recruiting sergeants as well, and the the idea of the, the king's shilling and then the king's shilling being taken off you for all your equipment um, uh, is, is, is always sort of a, 
thought, I always thought it was strange, but I could understand it from their perspective. And as historians or amateur historians in my case, um, I think you've got to try to put yourself in their position and understand the world from as best you can, not from your own perspective of hot running water, easily available food, perfect communications, you know, an ability to speak to anybody with a magic box pretty much anywhere in the world simultaneously. These are things that were literally fantasy or impossible to even conceive of, but not that long ago. Yeah, well, so, definitely. What well, do you and the hardest one, of course, is the first, well, not one of them, but the hardest one for many people is First World War infantry. You know, the idea that these young men climbed out of those trenches and it mm. wasn't just a fear of being shot by their own sergeant. It was, seems to be, that they were willing participants in those attacks that we we now know were had no very little chance of success. Uh, and many of them were, you know, killed, shot, machine gunned and, and blown to pieces by shrapnel and left to dangle on the barbed wire. And, and it's, I've, you know, I've been at the centre of a few internet storms and most of them very deserved. But the one I was most interested by was when I wrote, I tried to just write about what motivated those First World War soldiers and the fact that many of them enjoyed, many of them, not all of them, some, you know, many of the millions of people who served kind of enjoyed their experiences in the First World War. And as you say, there was food, there were long periods out of the trenches uh, there were long periods of of being behind the lines and and the camaraderie, the sexual opportunities, the travel, the the, the money. You're making money. Um, some of the risks didn't seem quite as severe as they do now because being in industrial communities, being in a mining community in 1910, you'd have been used to catastrophic loss of life in the most mm. appalling circumstances imaginable, buried underground. You know all that stuff, explosions of gases. So there are a whole bunch of reasons why, for us, the choices and and the and the experiences of that generation just seem like you know inexplicable. But at the time, as you so rightly say, that it, you know these things make sense. These 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 it, it was a shocking experience for many many of them who lived with debilitating physical and and mental uh, wounds. For the rest of their lives but for many people it, it could be a it, they could have got away with it if they're in the right place the right time war could have war could have been in, perhaps even enjoyable mm. i mean it's interesting to sort of brought up the idea of what we understand now as ptsd and and the the long-term mental effects of of combat and i always wonder when you look back through the historical record do we see potential examples of exactly those phenomena but not understood. You know, do we do we understand, do? Yeah, you know, the Battle of Towton, people slaughtering each other in the in the thousands oh, God. by hand. You know, literally seeing somebody there and smashing their face in with a hammer, and doing that repeatedly. Um, surely that would have generated just as much PTSD in those people. And um, um, can we tease that out of the historical record at all? What happened to these people afterwards? Did they become traveling vagabonds presumably there was a certain amount of uh suicide afterwards you know people that couldn't cope with it and, and all the things that would manifest and we would understand more today back in the old days i mean did the ancient greeks suffer from ptsd those phalanxes that they had yeah. and people being stabbed to death or crushed or just doesn't bear thinking about and doesn't it's history it filled with people with these problems? I think probably the answer is yes, but we just don't know about it very much. Yeah, there was a great professor at my university who sort of said, was it worse to, was it worse to drag a pike in the 30 years war when armies were just ripped apart by starvation and typhus and dysentery? Or was it worse to be a British German serviceman in the First World War? And, and some, you, know, you, you start to sort of crunch the numbers. And, and obviously there was something unique about the First World War because of the kind of industrialised slaughter, the randomness of death, potentially, the sort of, mm -hmm. you know, you could, like, Ernst Jünger was, it seems, to, Ernst Jünger, Storm of Steel, he's behind the lines, and suddenly his whole platoon is just wiped out by a stray British shell. And it's that, I think, that nature of the kind of randomness, arbitrariness, no, no, no safe areas were within reason. Mm. Uh, I think that must have been particularly weird and, and must have discombobulated people. Um, but yeah, coughing, watching your mates cough their guts out and and you know bleeding out and and uh, in, in in any in any of these conflicts and and with with casualty rates per capita far higher than the Battle of the Somme. You know, are, are not unusual for armies to lose half their strength 
um, in in battles that you'll have covered, and mm. I, I was you know I've looked at and and so I, I agree. The only I'm really it's funny you said that. I'm quite interested, and in, if anyone listens to this and wants to send me any examples, I love raking through early sources and for any reference of PTSD. There are some from the Battle of Trafalgar, the Napoleonic Wars, so the early days of. Um, Bethlehem Hospital, which, you know, so, which gave its name to sort of Bedlam, the expression Bedlam. Uh, so many of its early inmates, or early recorded in, 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 like 19th century visitors, would say, "Oh, you know, quite obviously, there's a few people in here from the from the French Wars." And it's like, well, obvi obviously, that's fascinating, you know. So there were absolutely former servicemen who who who's well, Trafalgar, Waterloo, elsewhere, whose whose minds had just been terribly terribly damaged by what they'd seen. Can you imagine the Can you imagine the gun deck of a of a, of a of a ship in that period you know cannonballs coming through supersonic splinters cartwheeling around razor sharp ripping people in half ripping people open so decks painted red so you wouldn't notice the amount of blood on the deck i mean i i defy anyone to to think that was you know bet sort of somehow better or nicer than the industrial warfare mm. of the 20th century so um i think i think definitely i i'm it's an area that i'm totally fascinated by but as you say anyone who 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 saw the bridge of dead at Towton across that river? Mm. Uh, you, you, they must have they must have been changed, surely. Uh, you you would think so. You would think because we as human beings we haven't changed that much. Our psychology is largely the same. You know, we we have different educational standards and probably different expectations of what what our lives should be. But but even so, that you know that that river that beck running red with blood is just such a strong horrible image. Was it twenty thousand? Was it 20,000 dead? I can't remember the exact numbers, but vast numbers of men on both sides. And one of those horrible battles, inter, you know, brother on brother battles where nobody is kind of wanting to give up and everybody is just willing to pile into the slaughter. It's absolutely, absolutely awful. But I, but I wonder whether in the future, so one of the things I sometimes speculate on is um, what will we be looking back at as humanity in 500 years onto today's situation. What will, what will we see about today that we think of as normal uh, and that, that, that will seem really extraordinary to them? And one of the examples, there's a couple of examples just to kind of kick off this thought is I used to drive along the Foss Way to get to and from Oxford. Um, and occasionally I'm driving along there in a little mini, my first car, very, very pleased to have that. And thinking there must've been Roman soldiers walking along here a few thousand years ago. I wonder if any of them were thinking what will be here in a thousand years time? What will it be here in 2000 years time? And here's me 2000 years later thinking, hello, Roman soldier. I wonder if you're thinking about me. And then I thought, I wonder if the Foss Way will still be there in some way in another 2000 years. And then looking back at today, how will, how will historians look at yeah, Brexit as a as a major issue potentially. Look at the uh, um, American elections and the all sorts of complexities that are going on in 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 politics in the world. The information storm, fake news, all of this is going to be seen in some kind of context. I always wonder what that context will be and how they will describe us. Are you know are we the new dark ages? Are uh, <laughs> I don't know. First of all, <clears throat> I know I'm among friends when people say I was driving on the Fosway rather than the A303. So uh, that's, <laughs> uh, that's how, how we should refer to our modern road network by the Romanists. <laughs> uh, I think yeah, that is the most interesting question, isn't it? I mean, I can't help thinking, well, first of all, it, it, the, 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 in 500 years' time, I don't think anybody will remember Donald Trump or Boris Johnson or, well, ho hopefully not President Xi or Vladimir Putin, short of a catastrophic nuclear interstate war that sees a sort of discontinuity of life on Earth. I hope they, these kind of political leaders come and go. I think it's going to be, of course, the internet and technology, isn't it? This this kind of transformation in how we communicate with each other and do business and do everything. Um, now into the, you know, it's now we even areas that 15 years ago we thought were probably pretty safe, like sex and 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 dating and par finding partners now the internet dominates that space as well who, who knew and it may it may come to dominate medicine for example in in the next few years which or, or even or some, you know even areas that we don't know yet um i think that that's something that they will they will be thinking about um i can't help thinking that they will find the climate breakdown fascinating i mean there's guys like me who sort of 
make all the right noises about climate, but I hop on planes left, right and centre and I'm, I eat beef and I, you know, I've, I've bought an electric car, but I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I, I was, I'm doing things in my life. Uh, I'm not out there with Greta Thunberg kind of on the streets, even though I know that this is a potentially existential catastrophe for us all. They might find that a bit weird. They might find that like what how, those generations sort of knew it was coming and then they but you know they did bits and bobs around the edges but they didn't they didn't go on a kind of wartime footing until it was too late or so i think that that's going to be something that's that's really interesting for people to watch as, as we attempt to kind of decarbonize our, our our economies and whether that happens soon enough um, and i think the things that we're able to do to our bodies right um the science that you know we were able to you know we're having these amazing debates at the moment of furious screaming fights about biological sex and gender. Well, and they're kind of partly coming around, coming about because we have developed the technology to like basically, you know, to ch change many of the biological characteristics from one sex to another, you know, that's, and that's only going to increase, you know, when, when's the clever pill coming out, you know, when's the, when's the, When's the pill that's going to, you know, um, um, upgrade our memories or upgrade, you know, upgrade our systems really? And I think that that's all. So that kind of biochemical side of it as well, I think, is hugely important. And then space. I think space. Uh, when 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 Neil Armstrong died, I thought he'd he's a good shout, good chance. He's the only person from the twentieth century who'll be remembered in a thousand years' time. That's my. That's a. That's my. That's really interesting because he was first man. Yeah. Yeah, and I think. You know, because we 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 find you know Mao and Star Mao and Stalin and Hitler and Church or whatever else. You know, who today has heard of Charles V or or Montezu? Like, I mean, not many. Like, those political leaders are not that important. Even the even not the genocidal mass murdering ones. And I suspect it's if you look back, it's the artist and the scientist and the explorer. I mean, I'm just this is me off the top of my head, but I I, I think it's it's you're more likely to remember well depending on artistic taste who knows maybe mick jack maybe the beatles still been played in a thousand years time maybe like you know just like beethoven maybe they'll still be you know but I, we can't account for taste so i can't answer that but i do think that we're going to be living on various different um celestial objects by that point and therefore the first man to land on one of them that's a big he's he'll get a he'll get a fair bit of attention i think wherever we wherever we go in the universe so uh, yeah well i was uh, i was also thinking about yeah the, the all the wonderful stuff that that various of the space agencies are doing and exploring the planets and landing you know uh, rovers on on uh, on mars recently and how incredibly detailed those images are and and how we're slowly building up tiny bits of detritus on mars and i was thinking just like today some religions build quite complex buildings around a sort of a, a key rock or a special place for for their religion or their you know their world belief i wonder if in i don't know 200 years i think it's very likely actually that where one of those rovers is right now will be the center of a kind of grand mars exploration museum and there'll be a dome over it and and it, the patch of mars that's on it complete with the tracks is going to be visible to visitors, you know, as, as a sort of pristine piece of Mars real estate. And there's going to be a huge Mars city around it. And it's just going to be one of those things that Mars school kids go to visit. And this is, you know, here's one of the robots and there's another one somewhere else. And it, yeah. it just fascinates me that that might happen in the future. Well, yeah, like colonial uh, Jamestown in, in the US or yeah, yeah in, um, in Canada where my mum's from and, you know, Fort York at the heart of Toronto is this, now it's under an underpass and it's kind of, but is you know, there is a 18th century fort there, which is, you know, which was the beginning of it all. Um, I, well, sorry, the beginning of European settlement, the area. So I, I, I completely agree. And in fact, there's a great bit on the archaeology of the moon. There's a lot of stuff on the moon. You should check it out. You know, there's, oh, right. a, there's a moon buggy. There's the Apollo 11. Uh, well, there's lots of bits of Apollo 11 there. So, you know the flag for example so you're at, like it's really the the the, arch the, the, the heritage of of yes. mars and the moon is going to be super interesting i agree yeah and i i just i just love the idea that one you know one day some school kids going to be going mom this is boring i've read about this at school and then they're going on to some other exploration and and for me i found as i've got older history has become more interesting or rather shifted i've, I've always been interested in 
knights and castles and dinosaurs. I don't know why those are sort of big things in, in my life, but in a lot of other people's lives. But also the sort of human side of it is expanded. And, and I've also, I reflect on what it might have been like to be there. And then I sometimes, through my computer games, which often examine game playing futures and things like that, I, I always sort of, what if the future? And um, well, is, there, is there a period in history that you would love to revisit now uh, to sort of solve a puzzle or explain something that still bugs you? I mean, there are sort of classic moments in history, I suppose, but um, I've always wanted to go back to have a look at a, a major battle to see whether battles are really fought the way we think they were fought. Oh, no, of course. But first of all, I just love your point about the kid in, uh, going on the school trip. The idea of going on a school trip on the moon to look at the descent stage of the of the Apollo lunar, the, the lander, which is still there. It's like, you know, yeah. sort of spidery looking bit. Yeah. And it's and, and the kid's like, oh, come on, that's so boring. I mean, can you imagine <laughs> um, the moon moon school trips? So, yeah, I, of course, I battles are ever since I read John Keegan, you know, the, the, the kind of trying to work out and you've spent a career doing this. Well, what, do, what, do, what does that mean? Like, what does, what does like charge into a line of infantry who then gave way? Like, I, like, and I, and I read about in the, in the period I love is the 18th century. And, and you look, you read about the battle of Bladensburg or outside Washington, DC, when the Brits take Washington. And, and it's like, it just seems like the, Redcoats kind of just marched towards lines of U.S. infantry and they exchanged volleys and then the U.S. ran away. But like, what's the process by which they did that? You know, and, mm. and, in the, and then the First World War, an interesting historian said to me the other day, it's interesting. He thinks there was this kind of unwritten rule that you'd go over the top. You would do your best until the officers got killed. And then when the, when the officers were killed, you lay down and waited for dark. And it was then acceptable. The NCOs would then get you back in your trench. They go, all right, lads, come on, back we go. We had to go, let's go back. So you weren't expected to kind of, you, you, you like, as long as your junior, you know, as long as the kind of keen 19 year old from Harrow was up at the front, going, go on, lads, come on, we might get through the barbed wire here, let's go. You had to sort of, you know, let's go, all right, come on, let's follow him and let's do our best. The minute he got killed and, and the captain and the major, you, you were allowed to just go, right, well, this hasn't worked. <laughs> this, okay. this, this basically, so, and I, I think that the, the kind of, I love the mechanics by which, and you know, in your period, like, what is it? What's it mean when one battle, you know, that expression in the medieval period, like a battle of troops, like March and like a battle of Tewkesbury, we're talking on the anniversary of the battle of Tewkesbury, like what, what did, and then how long did that last? How long were they, how long could you, would two bodies of infantry at push of pike, and as they say in the later century, you know, like properly at each other's shield wall, knocking each other to bits, pushing, shoving, was there a clever rotation system that was bringing fresh blood into the front line, like I've seen it argued in the Roman period? Or, or did it just like, when one side just kind of got knackered or, or, or scared or a rumour went up, did the whole thing just disintegrate? Like, I, I agree. I'm, I would just love, I don't feel I know that. And I've spent my life reading and, mm. and sort of trying to look into this. And I still don't feel I know what that, what did Shooksbury actually look like? Yeah. I mean, how intense was the actual fighting? Because if you yeah. think about professional fighters today, but a two and a half minute round yeah. and they're yeah. rest, and they're not wearing anything particularly. You know, they're, they're stripped down, they're super fit, their nutrition is studied, they're, they're yeah. fed, yeah, they're being battered around, but they're properly fighting. If you're wearing armor and you're not fit and you're, you've got dysentery, your efficiency is gonna be yeah. dramatically reduced. And even if you're standing opposite somebody who's got a halberd and he's having a swing at you, you're having a swing at him, are you even going to put much strength into it? Yeah, or are you I just agree. sort of all going to stand there and kind of meet eyes and go, you know what, can we just not kill each other? Is that all right? Yeah. <laughs> and well, just no, sort no. of make a good show of it and then sit down or something. Yeah, and I think what, what really supports that view is that the, the, the winning side of these of the, many of these battles suffered so few casualties, even when the butcher's bill was vast for the losing side. So it really does imply that the, the, the lives were lost in the rout. So the minute you start running away and your cohesion's lost, as you well know, Jason comes in on his horse and just starts <laughs> hammering the, the, the infantry running away, right? Because they're in ones yeah. and twos. They've thrown away their weapons. They've torn off their helmets. They can run faster. They've thrown, And you, got, you guys just come in and absolutely butch them. And I think that's, you know, we mentioned Towton. That's my suspicion is that, that in, the, in the kind of decisive engagement, it's something else. It's not, it's not, 
pure bloodshed. It could be weight of numbers. It could be the psychopath theory of war. It could be like there's about 15 or 20 blokes who are massively into it. Yes. And and they, you know, like Har Harry they, they uh, kill Hotspur, everybody, yeah. They kill everyone. It's like Harry Hotspur at the Battle of Shrewsbury just goes on like an absolute rampage or Hardrada at Stamford Bridge. And, and the, if that is successful in sort of penetrating enemy shield wall and, and then and then you then they kind of lose cohesion, then everyone just runs, they goes, right, screw this, we're running away. Or mm. you obviously kill the enemy leader and ostentatiously they, they fall you like, right, well, I'm not dying for Goldbinson anymore because he's gone. So so I, I wonder if it's like, you know, you've got your your kind of your, your psychopathic, your kind of almost your bronze age heroes who who are are really on quite a small scale, even though they're big armies, all the actions in one kind of tiny bit. Mm. Um, or, or whether there is, you know, and I think things like outflank, you accidentally end up outflanking someone, or there's some, at Tewksbury, there's that weird, that completely accidental outflanking where, they, where a very small number of uh, of Yorkist troops crash into the Lancastrian flank, which just panics everyone, I think, and they yeah. just all sort yeah. of run. Um, and, and so I think it's probably that kind of thing. And, and having been in crowds in festivals and sporting occasions, you do get a sense that everyone's looking... Uh, you know, and I've been on a few political things where, which have all, which I think, yeah, but I've sort of, which have turned physical. But you are looking at the very small group of people that are making the noise and the energy over there, and you get the impression if it goes wrong, then you, then you run. You know, so that's my impression about Moscow. But you, I mean, you know, much better. Than well, me. well, I was wondering whether that's the whole concept of the heroic archetype, which in fact yeah. is the psychopath. So you know, go back all the way to the ancients, and there were a whole bunch of ordinary people like us. Yeah. And then there were one or two absolute psychopaths like Achilles or Hector, who, you know, for one reason or another, probably were genuine psychopaths, um, princes or whatever. Um, sorry if I've insulted anybody, but, you know, that maybe they were the ones that were happy to do the slaughter and everybody else just sort of like backed away quietly and tried to get on with looking like extras in the background of a movie and sort of pretending to fight, but sort of tacitly agreeing between them. A bit like the yeah. the truce during the you know first world war in the trenches at christmas everybody tacitly agreeing right right now we're just not going to kill each other all right you know we'll let the psychopaths battle it out and in fact the sort of heroic archetype is all the psychopaths <laughs> there's like tiny percentage of any army are the ones doing the actual yeah. damage and everybody else is is trying not to be spotted by a psychopath on the other side or by anybody who might get them into trouble for not putting enough energy into any in, in, into that. And I sometimes look at um, old old classic movies, you know, battle scenes, you know, sort of the, some of the sword and sandals stuff, Spartacus or whatever it might be. And if you look in the background, you can see people unconvincingly fighting each other. You know, they've obviously been doing it all day and they're both knackered and they're trying not to sort of be spotted by anybody or get into trouble for not fighting well enough. And I wonder whether if that movie fighting isn't actually quite similar. Yes, so interesting. To, to a yeah. real battle yeah. with the vast bulk of people going, I have got nothing against you, mate. I'm really sorry, but I'm not going to kill you either. So just make a show of it, please. Well, I think you're completely right. And there's a really interesting whole field of scholarship at the moment, isn't there, about, about people's unwillingness to kill people. Um, yeah. in, and, you know, famously at the Battle of Gettysburg, they recovered rifles off the field of battle and, and many of them have been reloaded many, many times on the urgings of a sergeant and not discharged. So you just had like nine, you know, nine yeah. balls in them. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, it's, and we know that the proximity to the other human makes that, it makes that impulse even greater. So, you know, it's, it's easier to kill someone, as we know, with a drone strike that is, is from Las Vegas. And you kind of look at mm. a video, grainy video of a Afghan compound and push the button, then go off and have a Starbucks. Now, for that drone operator to go into that compound and knife everybody there in the guts is, a, is you know, it's the same impact, it's the same effect, but it's very, very different. So I think that's the interesting thing about the Industrial Revolution, isn't it? That it made it easier to convince, it made it easier for people to kill people, basically. Mm. Um, yeah. And, you know, nice lads in in uh, Lancaster bombers flying up every night who, who wouldn't have thought about punching a German, let alone incinerating them and their family, um, mm. are, are responsible for the death of, and of course, all sides did this in the 20th century. But but I, I think that's the, and then the ultimate, obviously, extension of that is that one day someone will push a button and obliterate an entire country, at, at, you know, mm. or, or part of a continent yeah. um, through nuclear munitions. Um, and that, I, I think, on a, on a medieval battlefield where you are staring into the eyes of people, you're right, you're going to be like, look, mate, 
I mean, I'm, we're both here because we've been told to be here. But, mm. but the Aristos, the people with the leaders, the people who, who gained the most or sought to gain the most, you can see they might be bloody going for it in the middle there. And, yeah, and well, might, they... yeah, a nasty little, a really unpleasant little gang of 50 or 100 dudes just going after each other in the middle yeah. and everyone else kind of slightly watching them and see who gets the, who gets the upper hand. Yeah, but because I do think one of the reasons, because I'm, I'm fascinated by the slow uh, adoption of black powder weapons in the medieval period. I mean, they, they first sort of the handguns sort of come in around the end, you know, 1380s, 1390s, but don't really get taken up until, you know, 100 50 years, 150 years later, and I, one of the things I'm thinking about is they're grossly inaccurate, which make, which makes them really random. And if you're nobility, and you've got your really expensive horse and your really expensive armor, and the chances are only another posh guy with the expensive kit stands a chance of killing you. So you're broadly safe against the bulk of the warfare, yet some oik with a hand cannon aims at somebody else and the bullet pings off in another direction and goes straight through your breastplate and kills you i wonder whether the nobility went you know what that's not fair that's that i'm being killed by randomness not by some other mighty knight who's taken me on and um, same with crossbows as well there seems to be this tendency to to believe that warfare should be not exactly noble but should be not not random and when you start introducing gunpowder weapons artillery bombing these become more and more displaced from directed killing and they, they come indirect killing. As you said, you know, launching a drone strike is, is a computer game. I mean, they even use computer game controllers or similar things to computer game controllers. And, and it literally, you can li you've got layers of glass between you and the target. And I, I kind of wonder whether people didn't adopt the gun because it was too random to begin with. Um, and just level the playing field too much. And then you had to get down off your horse, otherwise you're a target. And then you had to not wear the posh kit because you're too much of a target. And then you actually started to direct the battle from 20 miles away via radio. Um, there's a general trend there, the more in charge of the army you are, as, as armies became more industrialized, the, the less chance the senior people were actually involved in the direct combat. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm certain that's right. I'm certain that's right. It, it just, it, it's just, it, it, there's no honor in it. There's no honor in, in getting killed on the battlefield by, a, a, you know, an, it, yuck, a yucky little smoky weapon in the hands of a peasant, is there? <laughs> yeah, no, none whatsoever. In fact, it's arguably embarrassing, which the nobility would definitely not want to be killed by an embarrassing circumstance you want to be killed yeah. heroically you want to be you want to be richard the third charging in you know taking out the banner bearer of, of, of henry tudor the usurper and 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 failing heroically you know that that's the sort of arguably one of the last grand gestures of the medieval period and what a way to end a, a period with a with a with a king losing his kingdom uh, on the battlefield in that fantastic way and add to that his scoliosis and his physical um, impairment you know what an what an incredibly interesting person to have a go at doing that but um yes i think we're nearly out of time i'm afraid you know well i could talk about this all day bud so let's make sure we do it again with a uh, in person with a drink in hand next time yeah yeah definitely fun. absolutely was there anything you wanted to um kind of promote or sort of mention to the audience no. that you know just normally history hit, which is great. Yeah. I'm a subscriber. Oh, it's so, so kind of you, man. Thank you for your support okay. from the beginning. But yeah, no, his, history hit TV is really exciting. We make, you know, proper historical documentaries. We're trying to get better all the time, more ambition all the time for true history fans. And they all podcast, well, history hit podcast. Fabulous. Brilliant, Dan. Well, that, that's been a pleasure. And we could we could literally talk for another few hours, but I'm, I'm aware that you're quite busy. I don't know how you put up. I don't know how you do so much. I, I genuinely don't. Well, I, I, come on, dude. You're running a bloody great big, massive, multi-trillion dollar business empire as well as doing all the stuff you do. So I won't take that from you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for saying so. 